Um, my question is for Dr. Suzuki. And <coughs> you were saying that you didn't want to legitimize his stance by being here and by having this publicized to the public. Now, I'm just wondering if you think that everybody believes what they read in the papers, what anybody tells them, or do they make informed decisions on what is around them, and do their parents actually affect what they hear, as in children? And in the case of university students, are we not here to see, view things from both perspectives? Now, whether he is right or wrong, don't you think we should have information from both sides, being university students, to make informed decisions, rather you stating your opinion up there. I think, I think the exciting part of university is being exposed to a broad range of ideas, you know, from the kooks on one side to the, the jerks and crazies on the other. And yet you're calling for him to be fired for expressing his views. See, this is the Moat and Bailey, right? I did a video on this called the, uh, the Moat and Bailey strategy. To, I think it's called the White Bailey was the name of the video on YouTube. You can look up on my channel. But this is what he does, right? On the, his, his moat is academic freedom. But the Bailey is you get fired for exploring what, what, whatever is politically incorrect, uh, I should say, um, not in line with communist orthodoxy. Um, so, and then when, when challenged on, hey, you're being a communist, he retreats back to academic freedom. And it's basically just running out the clock, oscillating between these two things, never admitting fully to either one. But then after the debate is done, saying that you stood for one all along. It's a super dirty tactic, but it's a common one. It's called the Moat and Bailey strategy. And I probably fall on one end and Rushton's on the other. I don't know. Sure. I didn't want to come here. I told the students that over and over, but they told me that they didn't feel they could respond to him. They didn't have the clout. They weren't professors. They didn't have PhDs. <laughs> and that they were being hammered by this, that in the press it was saying this and that, and academics were saying this, but no one would come and, and discuss. Now, quite frankly, I wish it had all blown over at the AAAS meetings in San Francisco. I had that, the article that he submitted there for weeks. I didn't want to do anything on it. But it was the students asking and no one being, having the whatever it takes to, uh, to appear that finally I felt that it couldn't be ignored because it had already become a public event. Now, the problem one always has, whether it's talking to the Rushtons or the Shockleys or the Jensens or whoever, is that one as a media broadcaster always worries, do you legitimize the person by putting him on? Because by virtue of having him on a program, it seems as if this thing is worth paying attention to. And all of the, the people who are really on the borderline, you know, especially if you have a someone who's a Nobel Prize winner or even a professor at a university, you say, well, gee, this professor said this, you know, that, that affects people. And so one wonders about that. Uh, I think this is just bad science. There's no reason to have a public debate about it because it's not science. Well, um, I felt that there wasn't really a debate on the issue because I wanted to hear both sides of the story. Now, I've heard a lot about Ru Dr. Rushton's and I wanted to hear your viewpoint as a genetic I thought I did that talking about the distribution of IQ scores, which is at the very heart of his argument. <laughs> Look at this girl. Look how base she is. Look at her. She's like, um, you know, I actually didn't, uh, I didn't hear you make an argument, sir. Um, I'd like to hear your opinion as a geneticist for, for how, what your counter argument is. And his response is, I did. I talked about IQ distributions, but all the IQ data is the other way. And the only thing he mentioned about IQ distributions is just that they're different within groups. You know, this one reminds me of this girl's like, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull this up. This is just, uh, <laughs> this, this girl is like the equivalent of like, uh, unexpected, unexpected thug life library edition. You guys ever see that? 
that's that's what this is. Uh, this <laughs> this girl is is unexpected thug life. Girl's like, like, hey, hey, this is a scientific debate. How come, how come you know bring no science? <laughs> Sorry, I, I look, I'm, I'm, I'm being, I'm being dumb right now, but, um, but it's serious. I mean, it's, this is a serious point. I mean, she came here for science, and this geneticist offered no genetic insight, and instead just proudly asked everyone to be dumb, and. You know, I've I've said this point already, but <laughs> this is you know walking into a math contest, and and not only do you say my answer is I don't have an answer, I don't want an answer, but that I am completely unwilling to even try to find an answer because it's immoral to try to find an answer. Don't bring morality into science, dude. That's so pre enlightenment. But wait, maybe that's what racial communism is. A regression to the pre-enlightenment days. And what I said is, I, I urge you again to listen to what I said about Bodmer and Cavalli Sforza. That, that was an eleven-page paper. The 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 Cavalli Sforza paper. That was that was an eleven-page paper that just makes the continuum fallacy for eleven pages. It just says we can't study it, guys. Whiteness isn't real, of course. Blackness is real, and Asianness is real. But Europeanness. <laughs> isn't real really i mean that's what whiteness is but um he doesn't even uh, understand it well enough to flesh it out in this all right let's finish this up come on frame that you can show heritability of, of iq scores but you can't legitimately compare the difference between them and that applies from iq scores to all of these so-called complex behavioral traits it's okay. as simple as that Okay, but you have your views, and he has his Sorry, views. Sorry, I, I say that as a geneticist. Okay, but I, I... As a geneticist, I say that I'm stupid. Don't you have to give me credibility because I'm saying I'm stupid as a geneticist. I came here to get informed information so I could decide, and I think that a lot of the university students are intelligent enough to screen out what is crazy and what is not and be able to decide for ourselves like i didn't feel that this was a debate oh this girl's so paced fucking paced i have to play the library clip again i have to do i just have to do this again Logos, that's order, that's logic, that's reason, that's enlightenment. Come on, get un get enlightened over here, uh, progressives. I mean, the, look, the fact is the alt-right is the party of science. And if anybody ever tries to tell you differently, engage them in scientific debate and say you can only use enlightenment principles. You can only use logos. You can only use facts logic and reason you are hereby forbidden you are banned you it's verboten to use emotional reasoning it is in, it is invalid to use empathy it is illegal to use lived experiences and then if they don't agree to those terms of the debate you say okay well then you are pre-enlightenment you are not the party of science of course, we're moving rapidly beyond that. As an aside, science is now deemed to be a Eurocentric scheme for the machinations of the white establishment and the indigenous principles of Afro-feminist intersectionality are soon going to turn math uh, into a uh, into a racist field it already is now a racist field that's what many high schools are now teaching 
<clears throat> but of course, the overlord class, the Jewish Asian overlord class of the 2060s, are simply going to apply those rules to the um, to the underclass, and they themselves are not going to. It's not going to apply to them. It's going to be like Israel and the African refugees. But sorry, back to the um, back to this base AF uh, student here. Sorry, we gotta play that one more time. From Notice how Suzuki doesn't respond. Complex behavioral traits. It's okay. as simple as that. Okay, but you have your views, and he has his. Sorry, views. I, ha I say that as a geneticist. Okay, but I, I, I came here to get informed information so I could decide, and I think that a lot of the university students are intelligent enough to screen out what is crazy and what is not, and be able to decide for ourselves. Like, I didn't feel that this was a debate. Now take a question from microphone number one. Okay, first off. By the way, that was like the last champion of academic freedom in, uh, in Western civilization. That girl, that was like the last stand of implicit enlightenment principles in science. Because remember, after this came the 1990s in, in the full-on political correctness movement. You saw it. That was a moment in history there, folks. That was, um, that was history. That was, uh, she, she gets a place in, in the Our Struggle section, too. First off, I would like to say that uh, I am offended by the basis of this work, Dr. Rushton, and I know that you requested this evening that we not talk about the ethical issues, but I think, as Dr. Suzuki has said, it's impossible to divorce science and ethics. No, it's not. I think that you made a politically bad decision when you made such an announcement in San Francisco. And whether you have any political feelings or motivations, it showed a blatant disregard <laughs> for those type of people who've been struggling against racism and hatred all their lives because of the environment. I mean, look, do you have any doubt that the alt-right is the, is the Galileo of the modern age? I mean, is there any doubt? I mean... I used to say that like, uh, you know, back when I was just like a, a Trump, like a based Jew Trump supporter. I used to say that, you know, where, you know, almost like uh, with that sort of righteous indignation of, can't you see, we're like modern day Galileos. But like, this is literally what we are. I mean, that's not a joke. There's no, there's no aspect of that that's facetious or hyperbolic. It's just a simple, pure statement of fact. You have people saying that our science should be illegal, that we should lose our livelihoods over it, that it's unethical to study the movement of the earth around the sun. <laughs> now, I would like to ask you a question that was posed to a class of mine the other day, and it goes to the effect of whether you had any sort of racial bias going into the study and why this sort of study is going on. Now, let's suppose, and for the sake of the audience and my safety, getting back to the seat, this is a purely hypothetical question. <laughs> let's suppose that your theory is true. What are you recommending? Are you recommending sweeping policy changes? As for instance, for education, are you recommending that we now only admit Orientals and some whites who are above average and no blacks, or maybe the opposite? Or can you tell me what are you recommending for immigration policies, for, fi for fighting crime, etc.? For the last seven or eight years, my research has been into trying to apply evolution uh, to genetic differences between people. About 20% of that research is concerned with race differences. The other 80% is concerned with sex differences and social class differences and just individual differences, all of which are also contentious issues. I have no policy recommendations to make. I do believe that there are all kinds of political and philosophical and ethical and economic and educational implications of accepting the view that there is an enormous amount of genetic and biological diversity, far more genetic and biological diversity in the human population than we've ever considered before. 